It's extremely important to assess rotational power with the athletes that I train because everything that they do on the field is predicated by how well they can rotate, how efficiently they can transfer energy from the floor all the way up through the fingertips, whether they're swinging or throwing an implement. So if they cannot rotate effectively, then there's no way that the ability to transfer everything from the weight room is going to be very efficient. So what we want to make sure we're doing is we're tracking to see how hard they throw medicine balls and how well they can decelerate the torso effectively, how well they can transfer energy up the kinetic chain. Uh, so what we're going to do first is have them go through a rotational shot put throw where the back elbow is high about shoulder height. They're going to rotate and throw towards the target. Now this is going to be a pretty good indicator of pressing strength at very high velocities, but it's also going to be uh, very correlative with throwing. It's a very similar action to throwing in that it's rotational from the lower body all the way through the upper body, and basically the entire action is similar um, all, uh, all the way up until the upper extremities were pushing instead of throwing the ball. Uh, so I like this one a lot because it's pretty safe on the upper extremities, typically speaking with the over the shoulder throw, athletes will wind up with some sort of valgus stress in the elbow and a lot of times we don't want any extra valgus stress on the elbow. I like the shot put throw, uh, but it's um, going to be a really good indicator of throwing power. From what I've found, athletes who can throw the lightweight medicine ball extremely hard in the shot put throw, typically speaking they have very good throwing velocities as well. And then with the rotational scoop toss, that's going to be where the ball is going to be held lower here by the hips and the athlete is going to be pitching the ball into the wall in a rotational manner. Obviously, this is going to be more correlative with swinging velocities. It's much more predicated with hip extension speeds and how fast they can pull those arms through uh, when they're throwing the ball. So what I like to do is track a force velocity profile, something with a 10, 6, and 2 pound medicine ball. You can also go something like a 12, 8, and 4 pound medicine ball. Any three evenly distributed weighted medicine balls is a really good way to develop a force velocity profile. Um, and so long as you can see how they handle the heavy, medium, and light loads, you should be able to get a good understanding of what they produce force like, where they are weakest, and where you need to address most in their training. You can also uh, monitor their stationary throws versus their shuffle throws. If they throw a lot faster, three, four, five miles per hour faster when they're shuffling versus when they're uh, stationary, then they may need to work on more static throws where they are going from a dead stop and developing as much force as possible because when you are out on the field as a pitcher or a hitter, you have to develop as much rotational force as possible from a dead stop. Now obviously if you're a positional player throwing, it's okay to be very good at that shuffle shot put throw because that's going to be more correlative with what you have to do out in the field. So, um, and also when it comes to those shuffle throws, there is a lot more force that has to be displaced into the front leg. So if that athlete is really struggling with shuffle throws, then perhaps they're struggling transferring extra momentum and extra force developed from the lower body because their front leg is struggling to accept all that force and transfer it up the chain. So that's a good little way to sort of see what the athlete is working with um, and how they produce force at different sort of velocities. But onto the force velocity profile, one that I like the best, we can really see when athletes throw those different weighted medicine balls where they are struggling and where they need to address most in their strength training. So if you have somebody who's relatively balanced, you might see a profile something like this with the two pound medicine ball at 37 miles per hour, the six pound medicine ball at 31, and the two pound medicine ball at 25 miles per hour. An evenly distributed weight, uh, six, pound, or six miles per hour difference between each pounded medicine ball. That matters a lot, the, the distribution, but you also see that it's a pretty uh, decent looking line. It's not extremely vertical the way this blue line is, and it's not very horizontal the way that red line is. That's another big difference too. When we're looking at velocity deficient athletes especially, you'll see that their profile is much more horizontal. There is not a big difference between those loads and how they throw the medicine ball, whereas somebody who's more force deficient will have a much more vertical looking profile where there's a big difference between how they throw the two pound, six pound, and 10 pound medicine balls. Uh, so an example of a force deficient athlete, something like the two pound medicine ball will be thrown very hard at 40 miles per hour, but then there's a big drop off after the six pound ball 
they'll have uh, 29 miles per hour and then 21 miles per hour with the 10 pound medicine ball. That's a big difference. So what we're seeing here is as the weight gets heavier, the athlete struggles more and more and more to produce high levels of velocity. And then with a velocity deficient athlete, what you might see is something like the two pound medicine ball only being 35 miles per hour. They don't produce a lot of velocity with that two pound ball, that lighter weight. And then maybe they throw the six pound ball pretty well at 31 miles per hour and they throw that 10 pound ball really well. Uh, something like 27 miles per hour in a uh, shot put throw or scoop toss. So if you see that the athlete is really good at a certain medicine ball weight and not so good at the other, then that should dictate how you go about training. If they really struggle at the force end of the spectrum with that 10 pound ball, then they probably need to do a lot more strength training and muscle mass training. If they're really struggling at that light loaded medicine ball, then they're probably gonna have to do a lot more high velocity training. The way I like to do it is a mix of both. I never opt for all heavy strength training or all high velocity training. It's always a balance. Those balanced athletes could probably go more 50-50 with their high velocity reps of plyometrics, medicine ball throws and sprints, and heavy strength training reps. With the more force deficient athletes, you're probably gonna to wanna to do a lot more heavy strength training and maybe only 20 or 30% of their training could be high velocity work in plyometrics. Whereas I would shift it for a velocity deficient athlete. You do just enough strength training to make sure that they are maintaining their overall force production. And then you'll have a lot more high velocity work with the medicine balls and you make sure that they are really improving in that medicine ball throwing velocity with those lighter loads. But it's not just about accelerating. It's not just about producing force at high speeds. In order to really swing and throw well, we have to be able to decelerate the torso and allow for those limbs to fl uh, really fly up and over the torso, whether we're swinging or throwing. Now, you want to make sure that you have the ability to rotate extremely fast and stop everything. That torso deceleration capability comes from a lot of trunk stiffness and a lot of coordination as well. We have to actively try to train this when you are throwing and swinging your implement. But when it comes to strength training, we can assess this if we were to go about uh, you doing sort of a rotational trunk action where the athlete is actively trying to rotate with a load as fast as they possibly could, starting all the way back here, even with the back leg rotating all the way out front, even with the, front, um, even with the middle of the chest out over the front leg, and then back. As, uh, as quickly as they possibly can. And what I would have athletes do is take a 25 pound weight, a 15 pound, pound weight, and a five pound weight and see what that difference is. You could track how long it takes them to go through an entire rep. That's pretty easy if you have a camera and some sort of a stopwatch app when you upload the video into that app. You can see how long it takes for each rep to go through an entire repetition. What I've also been doing is using the uh, push band where you could attach it here at the forearm and see how fast it takes the athlete uh, or how much speed the athlete can produce in a movement like this and um, we've seen really similar results so a uh, more balanced athlete from what I found they'll take the five pound weight and rotate all the way through and get it back to that starting position in 0.5 seconds um, and move it at about five meters per second at their peak speed that 15 pound weight, they'll move it and get it all the way back in about 0.75 seconds and move it at about four meters per second. And then lastly, that 25 pound weight, they'll move it um, all the way through the entire repetition at one second and move it at about three meters per second um, through that entire range of motion. So obviously what we're seeing here is the athlete can produce pretty similar uh, levels of drop off or improvement between loads depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, a more force deficient athlete would do very well with the five pound weight but they would really struggle when it came to that 25 pound weight. Instead of moving it through a fluid range of motion they might struggle to decelerate that weight and then move it back quickly and that would be pretty representative of how fast they can get through that repetition or how much overall speed they're developing with that repetition. Whereas a more velocity deficient athlete like myself, I was just trying this out. I was able to move the heavy weight relatively fast 
um, at about three meters per second or so, but I could not produce a whole lot of velocity when it came to that five pound weight. With that light load, I still wasn't moving all that much faster. So this is obviously something that you can track over time to see how good your core training is. Obviously core training has great implications for how fast you can swing, how much force you can produce when you're throwing. But if your core is not trained to be able to decelerate the torso and resist against excessive rotation of that spine, then there's no way you're going to be able to effectively transfer all that energy into your upper limbs. And that's what we want to start to track here. We want to track how much force you can produce at high speeds with those medicine ball throws and how well you can transfer force into the upper limbs with those torso deceleration drills.